Yes, the devil has been busy in our big backyard here in America. Indeed, he has. Well, welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and our executive producer and research assistant is Dr. Laura Cordner. Our engineer is Anita Brockenton. Well, the book we're reviewing tonight is Lost Civilizations. Well, from pyramids and underground bunkers to watery graves and ancient astronauts, Lost Civilizations examines the archaeological evidence and other traces left behind by more than 70 ancient civilizations. I'll mention a few, Atlantis, Gobekli Tepe, Anasazi disappearance in the American Southwest, Nazca lines in Peru, Denisovian ancestors in departure, Amazon cities in the jungle, Neanderthal ancestors extinction. Boy, this book has great stuff in it that I haven't even seen before. And that's kind of unusual when you do a radio show for 30 some years and uh, been covering this kind of thing in such a long time. Well, lost civilizations will leave the reader wondering about the true origins of mankind and whether what happened to past advanced civilizations, yeah, listen to this, might very well be happening again right now with over 120 photos and other graphics. It is richly illustrated and it is helpful with a bibliography and extensive index adds to its usefulness. The author is Jim Willis. He earned a master's degree in theology from Andover Newton Theological School. Well, that's kind of amazing to me because that's where I almost went until I studied the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, I withdrew. And he has been an ordained minister for over 40 years. He has also taught college courses in comparative religion and cross-cultural studies. His background in theology and education led to his writing 12 books on religion. Listen to this. The Apocalypse, Cross-Cultural Spirituality, The Mysteries of the Unknown. His books include Visible Ink Presses, Ancient Gods, Lost Histories, Hidden Truths, and Conspiracy of Silence. He should have been a radio guy. Well, maybe he will be after tonight. Supernatural Gods, Spiritual Mysteries, Psychic Experiences, and Scientific Truth, Armageddon Now, and listen to this, The End of the World from A to Z, and the religion book, Willis resides in the woods of South Carolina with his wife, Barbara. Hello there. How you doing? Hi, <laughs> Hi Dr. Bob. I love it. I love it. You yeah. make me sound so interesting. But you are. You are. This is a fabulous book. It really is. Oh, thank you. I cannot over... I, there's no way to overemphasize that or exaggerate it. There are so many good things in it. And I will also I just want to thank you before we start... I have a very dear friend a long, long time ago who really wasn't paid much attention to, but is certainly now. His name was Charles Hapgood. Charles oh, yes. Hapgood was a damn good friend of mine. He gave me 90 of his books and signed them, and we, we gave them all out across the country years ago. Wow. I, I only got one left. And that's too bad. But anyway, I love this guy, and I had no idea anyone paid any more attention to him. And you oh, sure as hell yes. you did. Yes. As a matter of fact, um, when he was up at um, Keene State College for a while, I was living in Massachusetts, and uh, we never had a chance to meet. I wish I could because he contributed so much to uh, early map making and the uh, uh, the possibility of a very early discovery of Atlantis and continental shift. Um, he's just a fa fascinating guy. I would have really loved to have met him. I envy you for having him as a friend. Well, he taught at a school that I founded called AUM Esoteric Study Center, which was the first school of its kind on the yeah. East Coast that won accreditation. Uh, yeah. That was damn hard to do in 1970s. Boy, I'll oh, tell yeah. you. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's get back to work on you, okay? <laughs> as, <laughs> as, a, as a minister, college professor, Musician, carpenter, long-distance bicycle rider. I wish I would have done that. An author, you were engaged for your whole life in working with people. What made you move to the woods and become a hermit? When I retired in 72, um, I, 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 when I was 60, 62 years old, rather, and retired, 
um, I didn't know what had happened. I, you know, back in 1972, when I went into the ministry, uh, first went to seminary, uh, most of us back then, we were young. We didn't know any better. We thought that going into the ministry meant your whole life was going to be involved in this great spiritual quest. Yeah. And uh, we were going to be involved with, surrounded by people who were asking the same great questions. Who are we? What gives our life meaning? Uh, where did we come from? When did we begin our journey? Uh, why does life seem so difficult at times? I thought that was what it was going to all be about. Um, and then I, I got out of seminary, but uh, I, and I went to my first church, and I just I found myself right in the middle of my first great theological discussion, my first great uh, my first great church argument. After the church service was over, my first service, I was shaking hands with everybody. We went downstairs, and then the great question was asked: um, This is the new minister. Should we use the good china or should we just use the uh, paper cups for the coffee hour? And I discovered that was the first minutia I was involved in. And, you know, you, you get into the church, and I love it. I love the people. Oh, yeah. But um, all of a sudden, I was involved in the politics of it and the planning of it and all of the other things and the teaching and all was preparing. And there was hardly any time to develop a real spiritual life. And 40 years later, I found myself saying, what happened? So when my wife and I um, retired back uh, oh, 11, almost 11 years ago now, we, uh, we decided that we were going to seek that kind of spiritual life that we had expected to follow for our whole lives. And uh, instead of going and being surrounding ourselves with people and doing all the things that um, AARP magazine says you're supposed to do, we decided to go on a retreat. And we came up here to South Carolina. Uh, I built this house back in the woods, and we brought in electricity and put in a septic system, and we uh, drilled a well and did all that kind of stuff. And we were going to come in and, and, and really meditate and live in a, on, on a retreat for one year. And that was, like I say, now almost 11 years ago. We're still here. And uh, I just don't know what I really would have done it because I discovered uh, the essence of what I was searching for in spirituality. It didn't come to me, strangely enough, through my Christian tradition that I was so familiar with. Um, I wrestled with God. <laughs> I even had a verse in mind when I came out here, um, and it was a verse taken from the Old Testament of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Uh, Jacob and Esau were separated. They had their big, their big problem, family problem. And uh, Jacob headed north up toward what is now Turkey, and uh, he was estranged from his brother Esau for a long time. And when he left, Esau was after him. He was threatening to kill him and everything else. It was a horrible thing. But years went by, and finally Jacob came back, and he, uh, dis he was going to be reconciled with his brother Esau. And so the night before they were going to meet, uh, Jacob was doing what we all do at night when we're worried about what the next day brings. He was uh, up and pacing back and forth. And on the banks of the river, uh, the Bible says that he met this, uh, this stranger, and they wrestled together all night. I don't know why. The Bible doesn't say why they started to wrestle, but that's what they did. They wrestled together. And at, as the dawn began to break, Jacob uh, realized that he had been wrestling with God. And he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And that verse was in my mind. I wanted to come out here to the woods, and I didn't want to just learn about spirituality. I just didn't want to learn about God. I wanted to wrestle with the essential spirituality that was here. And so that was the verse that was in my mind. I will not let you go until you bless me. Little did I know that I was um, I was almost being led into this because I discovered a couple of years ago I was asked to go to uh, Cornwall over in the UK and give a talk there to a group of, called the Parallel Community about um, ancient uh, about world religions and I had never been to England before and while I was there I had to go to this little town up northwest of London called Fenny Compton because my ancestors, uh, my great-great-great-great-great 
I don't know how many generations ago, ancestors were ministers in the Church of England, and they used to preach in this little church in Fenny Compton that still stands there, this little this little uh, stone church. And I got hold of the librarian when I got up there, who was also the town historian, and she got me into the church, and I saw the plaque on the wall that said where the Willis, the, the minister, the Reverend Willis was. And I got up in his pulpit, and I was able to stand in the pulpit where my ancestor preached. And I looked across the sanctuary. You could only see it from the pulpit. There was a great stained glass window there. And on that stained glass window was an image that I had never seen in a stained glass window before. It was an image, a picture of Jacob wrestling with God, oh. saying, I will not let you go Indeed. until you bless me. Now, how my spiritual ancestor passed that on through my spiritual DNA, because I had never known anything about it until I came out here. But that's how we got into the woods. We came out here to wrestle with God. And lo and behold, the prayer was answered. Uh, we discovered God. But it wasn't through, like I say, my Christian tradition. It was much closer to uh, the, uh, a shamanic experience uh, that would have been familiar to the people that used to live here on this piece of ground thousands of years ago. Well, with with myself, thinking about that, I was just thinking about the experiences I had. I did some wrestling. I was a, probably the worst wrestler in the world. And I <laughs> did a lot of wrestling with the other priests uh, from the uh, standpoint of discussions. And when we got yeah. to the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, well, they just they couldn't tolerate that at that particular yeah. time. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's it's really interesting that you should say that, because the book that I'm working on now that uh, I it'll, it'll probably be a year before it comes out, but it's called Censoring God. And it's about the texts uh, that didn't make the Bible. Oh, and uh, yes. it, oh. they deal extensively with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, there are so many. Yeah. But there were so many that didn't make it. That's so unfortunate. But I I did enjoy I didn't have to wrestle. um uh, well, I didn't have to wrestle the nuns. It was from the nuns <laughs> that I learned because I saw when I was uh, working, I've forgotten all the names now, but I saw on at various events within the church yeah. beings. I saw sparkles. I saw things that, that, and so I would always talk to the minister. And I mm -hmm. said, did you see that? What are you talking about, kid? Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and, but it was, the, it was, of course, the, those women that were involved in the same thing that knew that. Yeah. They lectured yeah. me on that and what was going on. Oh, what color were they? I mean, yeah. that is the, what were the sparkles color? Were they pale blue? Were they pink? What are, you know? Yeah. And so that really made a big change in my life because I was very sad. I really did want to become a priest and stay there, but it became impossible. And then when I got to, of course, to, to other, other teachings, uh, uh, I, I, I'm glad that I did withdraw because I would have just been a problem to them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I didn't want to be, but I, yeah. you know, I, where I, I, you know, I kept asking, where in the world did these come from? And I can't we talk about them now. Yeah. You know, all my life, um, I I have been a, a, a living in my left left side of my brain. I've been an academic, and I've been preaching about all these things and teaching about all these things. And I had people um, who told me similar experiences, and I never, you know, denied them, but I never really accepted them either. Especially when people, I would be standing, uh, s sitting with somebody, holding their hand perhaps, and praying with them while they died. And uh, they would talk about seeing um, somebody standing at the foot of the bed. And I would just say, yeah, sure, okay, yeah, that's great, that's great. And I never really accepted it. And now that I've had some of those experiences myself, finally, I look back and I had those wasted times. And I say, oh, I could have learned so much had I just been more open-minded. And uh, it's, it's, it's terrible, isn't it, what we do with ourselves sometimes? Yep, yep, we sure do. But if... If we uh, look inside long enough, we'll get there. Time yeah. out here on the playing field on 21st Century Radio with Jim Willis. Lost Civilizations, the Secret Histories of and Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients. Published by Visible Inc. Press. Jim Willis, W-I-L-L-I-S dot net. All links are at 21stCenturyRadio.com.
Do you appreciate the Statue of Liberty as an American goddess? Well, we do in our new book, Secret Life of Lady Liberty, Goddess in the New World. It's been described as a long overdue feminist and multi-ethnic history of the Statue of Liberty that surprisingly draws our country's entire history through this iconic image. Appreciating the Statue of Liberty as America's goddess allowed us to explore her Native American and feminist roots and to envision a sustainable future where liberty indeed prevails. What can the Statue of Liberty teach us about women's power? Well, find out at www.secretlifeofladyliberty.com. That's secretlifeofladyliberty.com. Hi, this is Dr. Greg Little, co-author of Denisovan Origins. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. This is an incredible show with a great purpose, and I encourage you to not only listen, but to get others to also listen to it. Well, that was very nice of him. Wow, thank you. Okay, friends. Our guest is Jim Willis. Lost Civilizations, The Secret Histories and Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients, Visible Ink Press, jimwillis.net. And question number two. Are you, are you, are you there, Jim? I'm here. Oh, I'm right. here. Okay, I did. you might have fallen asleep over that. It was a long break there. <laughs> okay, Jim, take this. How did an ordained Protestant minister get interested in studying lost civilizations, let alone ancient gods and supernatural gods? How did, how did that oh, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> um, I had a good friend who, uh, whose father died when, uh, uh, two months before he was born. Mm. And uh, because he never knew his father, he grew up hearing about his father from different family members and from his mothers and his mother and other people like that. And over the years, he developed this, uh, this idea about who uh, his father was. Well, his mother eventually had to uh, move out of the house, and he went to help her move. And he went upstairs to the attic and uh, was putting together some things. And he discovered a group of journals that his father had kept, diaries. And as he began to read them, he had no idea they were there. As he began to read them, he discovered a totally different idea about who his father was. And uh, he put together a totally different picture. What was even worse was he discovered that his father uh, had died of uh, a disease that is sometimes passed down uh, through the generations. Oh. And so he might have had the same disease. Now, he went to get himself checked out, and the doctor checked it, and, and it, it turned out that he didn't have it. it. It had skipped him. So for that, he was thankful. But ever since then, I've had this uh, vision in my head that we have this idea about who our ancestors are. And uh, we're, we're told this and that in school, and we develop this picture. And after a while, we just come to accept it. But as I began to study more and more history, and especially as I was teaching college and teaching world religions, we would go back to the roots of those religions. And the farther back I went... I was surprised to discover all kinds of questions. And I discovered, uh, instead of the journals that were left behind, I discovered two lines of evidence that our ancestors left behind. One I called evidence in stone, and those were the, the, the megaliths and the artifacts that uh, our ancestors left behind. Gobekli Tepe, Stonehenge, uh, the, the, the ruins of uh, the Anasazi out in the west, the Peru, uh, Chichen Itza, and places like that. And I discovered that kind of evidence that gave me a totally different picture about these people. They could not have been the primitives that we're often told they are. But I also discovered, in uh, studying in ancient religions, and what I call a second line of evidence, evidence in story. And those are the mythologies, the texts, and the oral history. And this evidence in stone and evidence in story all seem to point backward in time to um, a people who were not at all what I uh, had been taught they were. They were not primitives. Uh, 
they they were not uh, um, you know people who were not intelligent and all this kind of thing. They were extremely intelligent, and they did some they wrote some fantastic stories, and they built some tremendous structures. And so from this uh, discovering so so to speak these lines of evidence, like my friend discovered his father's journals, uh, I also do ask, start asking the question, well, what happened to them? And in so many cases, I discovered that they also had a disease in some cases that caused them to disappear, that caused them to become lost. And I begin to wonder, have we inherited that disease? Do we do some of the same things in our society today that, uh, that, that, that they did? And I began to look into it, and the farther I went, the more the the, the, the farther back in history I went, until um, we're now we're talking thousands of years, and it was a totally different picture. Uh, and so I realized that what I had uh, studied and what I had been taught was simply not sufficient, and uh, that's one of the reasons we came out here to the woods and decided to pursue this farther. And uh, the more I pursue it, the more fascinated I become. Do you feel it's sufficient now? Pardon me. Do you feel sufficient now that this that, that this learning is sufficient to you now, or? Well, uh, not not really sufficient, I wouldn't say, because so much of it uh, is uh, I would almost use the term revelatory. Oh yes. Um, I've learned so much not just by studying the evidence and by reading the books. And by visiting the places, uh, you know, visiting Egypt and places like that, walking down underneath. But there's also, uh, I discovered a whole, a whole brand new way of looking that, and that's the uh, intuitive and uh, uh, spiritual application of meditation and being in touch with what was and getting a feeling not for what these people did, but for who these people are. And I'm convinced that they can still, they can still talk to us. And uh, I, I don't think that they talk to us simply through their, uh, the evidence they left behind. I, I think that we can actually feel the vibrations of, of, um, of people who have been here before. I think they're still here, and we're just simply not aware of it. Uh, the last book that I wrote uh, I, uh, came out last December, I think it's called. It's called The Quantum Akashic Field, and it's a guide to out-of-body experiences for the astral traveler. And it's, it is about out-of-body experience and what the lessons we can learn, which is an old, old practice that was practiced by shamans thousands of years ago. It is that, but it's not just this, uh, oh, woo-woo, new age stuff. I think it's based in a science that we just don't understand, but we're beginning to. When uh, scientists uh, discovered within the last hundred years the whole idea of the quantum akasha, uh, the, the uh, quantum theory, I think their mathematics was leading them to explore a landscape that has been has been explored by shaman and by mystics and by rishis and all the rest of these people for thousands of years. So in other words, in our generation, science and spirituality, which have been two uh, highways moving down the road in parallel to each other, I think they're beginning to come together for the first time. And uh, I find that fascinating. Just absolutely fascinating, and I'm I'm uh, I'm really excited when my wife and I discover here, for instance, right on the property where we live, uh, when we discover an old spear point or an old tool, uh, or a, a stone tool or something like that. You hold it in your hands, and you realize you're the first person to hold this in your hands for thousands of years, and I swear it almost speaks to you. It's fascinating, just absolutely fascinating. It's even more fascinating when we all learn that. It may be a rock or a stone, but it has a very, it does have some type. I, I would call it consciousness. I don't think yes, others would. Yes, I think would. so too. Yeah, I agree I think fully. that just everything has a consciousness to it. Yeah. Um, and that, I think, is the key when you become close to these stones. We, we've been collecting a lot of stones. Um, uh, and it's just a wonderful experience to to go into that world. As a matter of fact, I was very desirous of putting a book, another book in the uh, package that we were made for you, dealing with stones. Uh, And I thought, oh, no, he's going to laugh at that. Oh, no, not not at all. uh, Not at all. But there's... we 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 live on an old stone quarry uh 
uh, thousands of years ago, uh, people used to come here, and they would get the stones that they used for their um, that they would need to make their their tools for the year. And uh, I knew that this was an ancient land, and I knew it had earth energies through my dowsing experience and things like that. I knew there were earth energies here that were really profound and very deep. But little did we know that right down the river from us, uh, right down the Savannah River from us, there's an archaeological site called the Topper Site. And it has just turned archaeology upside down in the last 15 years because what they have discovered is uh, absolutely been verified again and again, human presence right here on this spot of ground where we live that goes back as long as 50,000 years. Yeah. Now, we, we, we've we been told that, of course, the first people here were the Clovis people, and they came over about 16,000 years ago, and that has been, you know, the oldest people in America were 16,000 years ago. We've been told that for 50, 60, 70 years. Sure. Now yeah. that's just not the case. And people say, well, why haven't we found any evidence? And then it comes out, well, we have found the evidence. It's all over. It's just been ignored because it hasn't fit into the parameters of uh, the accepted archaeological thing. Uh, Al Goodyear, who uh, he's retired now, but he led the, the, the dig down at the topper site, and he probably said it best when he said, well, you can't find what you're not looking for. And for years, we just assumed that we had it right and that the Clovis people were here. The uh, theory was even called Clovis first. Yeah. Now we know that's simply not the case. There has been a presence here in America that goes back at least 50,000 years. And quite frankly, I'm inclined to think it goes back closer to 100, maybe even 110,000 years now with some of the latest finds from like out in California and other places. I think we're living on land that uh, has been... Uh, it was old far, far before any time we ever thought of people lived here. And uh, I'm sure, given that much time, because they were intelligent as we are, they had the same brain capacity we do, I'm sure that they had developed uh, civilizations that are now gone. Now, we may say, well, how come we don't see their the computers? How come we don't see their wires? How come? I, you know, just because we made the decision to follow that route, the technological route, doesn't mean our ancestors did. I think they had a totally different toolkit than we had. Yes, I call it a, a psychic yeah. toolkit. I think they were in touch with things, like, as you said, holding that rock and feeling consciousness and everything about them. I think they were in touch with something that we have forgotten. And it's still in us, but it's atrophied because over the last, uh, uh, you know, centuries, we have developed into a very right, a left-brain technological species. And so we tend to think that all civilizations must have looked like ours. Well, I don't think they did. I think they were totally different. Uh, were they better than ours or worse than ours? I don't think you can even use those words. They were just different. That's all. But the evidence is there if we're open our minds to look at to look at it. No doubt it is. I I'm so biased now in regards to, uh, well, I think I think there was back at least 130,000 years. I would take it back that far as oh, yeah. in California, and some some are saying much more than that. Yeah, but, the, but yeah. I just love the way you write. You're a hell of a good writer. Well, and, thank you, thank and, you very much. And the, the, the information that you you're you're distributing, so to speak, is just fantastic. Mainly because, you know. This is kind of basic, basic um, uh, knowledge right now. We're moving yeah. into a whole other world in which we must, if, through meditation, prayer, but I think especially through service, service to others, helping others. That's what I think right now is, is the key, especially yeah. in our country right now and in the world. We yeah. must forget about... Uh, lefts and rights and who's right and who's wrong along those because we're not that's obviously not going to be answered but we must take care of our children we must take care of the elders because they have the wisdom and knowledge about things which the younger people do not yeah oh excuse me i I better take uh you know um, when when the uh, when the spanish first came to uh, florida uh and they began to trade with the with the uh the native people there uh, the the Indians of, of Florida 
faced a tremendous problem because the Spanish brought diseases with them, and a tremendous pandemic went through went through uh, Florida, and 95 percent of the population of the indigenous population died within a matter of decades. And when that hit, when the people began to get sick of all these smallpox and other diseases that they had absolutely no defenses for, when they began to die off, the uh, the older you know the, the the older people died, and the younger people died because they were the most susceptible, and the uh, older people died and the wisdom died with them. The younger people died and the future died with them. And what they were left with was that middle generation that had lost the wisdom that was given to them by the elders. And as a result, the elders were saying, we've survived for a long time without all of these trinkets, without all of these weapons, without all of this different way of doing things. We've survived for a long time without all of those things. But the younger people, the indigenous people, having lost that wisdom, they wanted the trinkets. They wanted the technology. They wanted the guns. They wanted the frying pans. They wanted the, the, the beads and all that kind of stuff. And without the wisdom of the elders, that became a lost civilization, a civilization that had survived for thousands of years. And uh, it, it, it's, it, you can see it in different places down through Florida, uh, I mean, uh, but you can see it different places throughout the world as well. And uh, I think that's, that's one of the things that civilizations have to be careful about. If we don't learn from what happened to these civilizations, we're bound to repeat their mistakes. And that, that will really be a tragedy. Yes, it is a tragedy, especially down in Florida. I've seen some of the more recent stories by which it appears that they are going to lose their drinking water, and it may happen faster than they thought. And it's break time here on 21st Century Radio on our, with our guest, Jim Willis. Willis, Lost Civilizations. The Secret Histories and Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients, Visible Ink Press, jimwillis.net. All links are at 21stCenturyRadio.com and find our audio archives for free on YouTube and iTunes. Eighty thousand leagues beneath the sea it lay. Or lie, I'm not too sure. Our guest is Jim Willis, author of the book Lost Civilizations. Jim, yes. do you know which lost civilization is being talked about there in that clip that we just played? You want to play it again there? 80,000 leagues beneath the sea it lay. Or lie, I'm not too sure. <gasps> Okay. I, I couldn't quite make it out. Beneath the sea? Yep, yep, yep. We're talking, we're talking about Atlantis now, or? There's a hint. Once upon a time, or maybe twice, there was an unearthly paradise called Pepperland. Yeah. Called that, what? Not, you, you, you got me. <laughs> Pepperland. Pepperland. Yes, in the Yellow Submarine. Oh, goodness. Oh, no, that was late Beatles. I was early Beatles. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm, a la I'm, I'm more of a late Beatles fan. We, we did a book, a 400-page book on the Yellow Submarine, part one. Wow. We are almost finished, I would say, in another three or three months or so, and finishing part two, which we've been trying to do for seven years, but everything else got kind of got in the way. <laughs> So, but you did get the answer eventually. So, well, well, you know, being a being a, a, a musician, I had my own band, and we could do. We you know we had to cover a lot of the Beatles tunes when I was younger. But when they went into the studio, uh, of course, we couldn't cover them anymore on a you know it, with with a live band. So I kind of dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I would say I'm an early Beatles guy. <laughs> oh, now I understand. Je comprends. I was a, in a pre. That's a. From a previous lifetime in French, yeah. <laughs> I, I had seven years of French in this lifetime, and I can't speak it. That's crazy. Uh, so, but you have just won. Um, let's see, uh, a yellow submarine Beatles guitar pick, and wow. and and Bo Bob Marley. Ah. Yes, another dear friend of ours, Bob Marley. 
Oh, yeah. so we'll be sending them along to you, and it oh, only cost you, you $400 a piece. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right, we got to get back to this. Time's running out, and you've got so much to say. You say we are a species who have developed amnesia about our past. What led you to that conclusion? Is there any evidence out there about that? Yeah, I'm, I think so. Um, and I, I mentioned a little bit earlier the evidence in stone and evidence in story. But when I talk about having amnesia from our past, uh, I can't help but give a, an, an example. Uh, when I was in, uh, in Egypt and uh, exploring in the Great Pyramid, uh, for instance, I, I just could never buy the story of how the pyramids got built. I don't think anybody knows, especially the Egyptologists. You're I don't right. think they yeah. know. They come up with all of these things, but when you act these ideas, but when you actually get there and see this, you wonder how could it possibly be? And it all came to a head for me when you talk about developing amnesia. It all came to a head for me when we were going down into the the uh, the pyramid, and we were, of course, you had to bend over and you had to walk down this long straight tunnel. And I noticed that there were these electric lines that were running down along the, the walkway that we were walking on. And they were used to power the lights that were in there so we could see where we were going. Well, I began to wonder, I, how did they do this before electricity? How did the workers get down in here before there was electricity? They must have used torches. So I looked up at the ceiling, and there's not a smudge on the ceiling. There's no evidence whatsoever of any kind of uh, fire uh, activated light source, uh, torches or anything like that. And I was really curious as to how they could have done this. And so I went to the guide who was up at the front there, and we had stopped in one of the chambers. I went up to him and I said, um, without electricity and with no evidence of torches, uh, how, did they, how did they see to come in here and work? And the guide literally now, he was an Egyptologist, turned away from me, walked away, and as he walked away, he said, oh, they must have had some kind of light source. Yes. And that's all he said. <laughs> that was a, now, that wasn't you so talk about amnesia. Even the Egyptologists don't know how they lit the thing. I've heard all kinds of fantastic stories involving mirrors and everything like that, but when you actually get there on the ground and realize that we don't know how they built them, we don't know when they built them, we don't know how they could see to get down into there, we don't understand any of that. Now, there's all kinds of ideas, but we have amnesia. Now, that was just 6,000 years ago. If you want to go back to Gobekli Tepe, now all of a sudden we're going back more than 11,000 years ago. How did it happen that a group of hunter-gatherers one day woke up out of the blue and said, let's build this magnificent, t t uh, magnificent temple made out of uh, blocks that w we can't possibly lift without any kind of help or anything like that. And let's carve these intricate uh, you know, figures into them and everything else more than 11,000 years ago. How did they do it? Why did they do it? We don't know. We have amnesia. And with all of the interesting ideas you read, and everybody, of course, there's a lot of experts out there who claim that they have the answers, but they really don't. When you come right down to it, you realize that they're all just theories. Basically, we have amnesia. There is the evidence right there in front of us, but we have no idea how it came to be. It just doesn't make any sense. Those are the kinds of questions that I develop when I talk about having amnesia. And the part about amnesia is if you don't know who you were, then how can you possibly know uh, where you're going and, and where you're going to wind up? That is the scary part to me. Um, it, it should be known to us. For instance, back in, in 1783, a man by the name of Edward Gibbons wrote a monumental history book called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. 1783, and he developed five different reasons that the Roman Empire was uh, falling apart. And the first was that sports and entertainment received more and more money while the plight of the poor was neglected. God damn, if that's not what's happening today. And it, it goes on. The second one was that the money collected through the taxation went to the military rather than the public good. The infrastructure fell apart. Yeah. 
And the third was that violence in both uh, games and in public life, it became more and more accepted and prevalent. It, it became like entertainment. The fourth reason was that people's faith in government was undermined, and justly so, because the government had lost the ability to get along with each other and to rule properly. And the fifth one was that religions grew fragmented, and they became a cause of dissension rather than unity. People began to argue about them. Now, Edward Gibbons spotted this back in 1783, and even since then, we've developed amnesia about it. Here is evidence. We can see every one of those is happening in our society today, and we, can, and we, we really should be asking the question, uh, why? What happened to Rome? Why did the Roman Empire fall? Could it happen here? Well, we've developed amnesia as to the reasons. And uh, I, th- I think it's a tragedy. So when you ask um, why I say we have developed amnesia about our past and what led me to that conclusion, uh, there, there it is, right there. The evidence is there, uh, and we just have to remember what happened our, in our past, or I think we're bound to repeat it. Well, I think we are going to repeat it. Uh, you um, went to Egypt, and you... Yep. Did you meet Zahi, Zahi Hawass? No, no, I oh. didn't. He well, wasn't there. Good for he you. He wasn't there when I was. Uh, <laughs> good for so you. So I, I, didn't, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't have a chance to meet him. Well, fortunately, we, I was asked by our, our mayor and then governor to set up a sister city relationship with Luxor, Egypt. And, oh, yes. And also uh, we... We went over, my wife and I went over, and we worked with Sadat. And uh-huh. I had no idea that he was hated at that time. Uh, it was really heartbreaking when we finally found out that this man was hated, because we, we were in love with this man. Yep. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, one of the big problems we have there was this guy, Zaki Hawass, who oversaw everything and until recently, until about 2011, he finally... I think he got thrown out. Well, uh, he he still has a pretty pretty tight grip on things. Well, he so. still yeah, yeah, but that's the re- that's one of the reasons why there's so much stress in, in in regards to people trying to discover these things. Yeah, because he he was he's not a very kind person. Yeah, he's had he's had epic arguments with uh, with both Graham Hancock and uh, and uh, Andrew Collins and others like them, uh, Robert Bouval yeah. and some others. Uh, they've they've had epic confrontations. They really have. Well, thank you for mentioning those people, especially Collins. Just fantastic people to be alive with at the same time we are, which is yeah, really great. Yeah. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, Andrew was in, has been in touch with me. We we email back and forth once a week or so because um, he uh, went on a trip. He, he he wrote a book back in 1997-98 uh, from the ashes of angels, and uh, he dedicated it to the Kurdish people. Oh. And uh, uh, I read I, I've read everything that he's written, and uh, he and I got in first in touch when I had some questions about. Um, Cygnus, uh, the Cygnus uh, uh, rock piles in, in, in the shape of Cygnus the Swan here on the property where we live. And so he and I started going back and forth. But because he dedicated that book to the Kurdish people back in 97, 98, uh, and for a couple, couple of other reasons, he was banned from going to Turkey. He's not allowed in the country anymore, oh. and that's why he emailed to me, me and he said, "I've got this trip planned in September. Can you fill in for me?" And I said, "Most certainly." So that's how I happen to be going to Turkey this uh, this September with a, a tour over there, touring uh, Duran Kuyu and uh, uh, Çatalhöyük and Göbekli Tepe and uh, Istanbul and Haran and a lot of these other places that are there. Uh, he's, I, I think he's a tremendous scholar, a great writer, and uh, uh, it's just, it's, it's really something for me to see. He just came back from a trip. Uh, Andrew just got back from a trip in Egypt. And we're just about ready to take another break here, and we'll come back with you, Jim Willis, next hour. Lost Civilizations, the Secret Histories and Suppressed Technologies of the Ancients, Visible Ink Press, JimWillis.net. All links are at 21stCenturyRadio.com.